from the complete visions of and Catherine Emmerich. At the end, a prayer for the intercession of blessed and Catherine Emmerich. Very early the next morning Jesus repaired to the temple, not, however, to the common lecture hall, but to another in which Mary had made her offering. In the center of the hall, or rather, nearer to the entrance, stood the money box, an angular pillar, about half the height of a man, in which were three funnel-shaped openings to receive the money offerings, and at its foot was a little door. The box was covered with a red cloth over which hung a white transparent one. To the left was the seat for the priest who maintained order, and a table upon which could be laid doves and other objects brought as offerings. To the right and left of the entrance stood the seats for the women and the men, respectively. The rear of the hall was cut off by a grating, behind which the altar had been put up when Mary presented the child Jesus in the temple. Jesus today took the seat by the money box. It was an offering day for all that desired to purify themselves for the Paschal Feast. The Pharisees, on coming later, were greatly put out at finding Jesus there, but they declined his offer to yield to them his place. The apostles stood near him, two and two. The men came first to the money box, then the women, and after making their offering, they went out by another door to the left. The crowd stood without awaiting their turn, only five being allowed to enter at a time. Jesus sat there three hours. Toward midday, as a general thing, the offerings ended, but Jesus remained much longer, to the discontent of the Pharisees. This was the hall in which he had acquitted the woman taken in adultery. The temple was like three churches, one behind the other, each standing under an immense arch. In the first was the circular lecture hall. The place of offering in which Jesus was, lay to the right of this hall, a little toward the sanctuary. A long corridor led to it. The last offering was made by a poor, timid widow. No one could see how much the offering was, but Jesus knew what she had given and he told his disciples that she had given more than all the rest, for she had put into the money box all that she had left to buy herself food for that day. He sent her word to wait for him near the house of John Mark. In the afternoon, Jesus taught again in the customary place, that is, in the portico of the temple. The circular lecture hall was just opposite the door, and right and left were steps leading to the sanctuary, from which again another flight conducted to the Holy of Holies. As the Pharisees approached Jesus, he alluded to their not daring to arrest him the day before as they had intended, although he had given them a chance to do so. But his hour had not yet come, and it was not in their power to advance it. Still, it would come in its own time. The Pharisees, he went on to say, should not hope to celebrate as peaceful a Pasch as in former years, for they would not know where to hide themselves. The blood of the prophets whom they had murdered should fall upon their heads. The prophets themselves would rise from their graves, and the earth would be moved. In spite of these signs, however, the Pharisees would remain obstinate. Then he mentioned the poor widow's offering. When toward evening he left the temple, he spoke to her on the way and told her that her son would follow him. His words greatly rejoiced the poor mother. Her son joined the disciples even before the crucifixion. The widow was very devout and strongly attached to the Jewish observances, though simple-minded and upright. Jesus speaks of the destruction of the temple as Jesus was walking along with his disciples. One of them pointed to the temple and made some remark on its beauty. Jesus replied that one stone of it would not remain upon another. They were going to Mount Olivet, upon one side of which was a kind of pleasure garden containing a chair for instruction and seats cut in the mossy banks. The priests were accustomed to come hither to rest at evening after a long day's work. Jesus seated himself in the chair, and some of the apostles asked when the destruction of the temple would take place. It was then that Jesus recounted the evils that were to fall upon the city, and ended with the words, but he that shall persevere to the end, he shall be saved. He remained scarcely a quarter of an hour in this place. From this point of view the temple looked indescribably beautiful. It glistened so brightly under the rays of the setting sun that one could scarcely fix his eyes upon it. The walls were tessellated and built of beautiful sparkling stones, dark red and yellow. Solomon's temple had more gold in it, but this one abounded in glittering stones. The Pharisees were very greatly exasperated on Jesus' account. They held a council in the night and dispatched spies to watch him. 
they said if Judas would only come to them again, otherwise they did not well know how to proceed in the affair. Judas had not been with them since that first evening. Early on the following day Jesus returned to the resting place on Mount Olivet, and again spoke of the destruction of Jerusalem, illustrating with the similitude of a fig tree that was there standing. He said that he had already been betrayed, though the traitor had not yet mentioned his name, and had merely made the offer to betray him. The Pharisees desired to see the traitor again, but he, Jesus, wanted him to be converted, to repent, and not to despair. Jesus said all this in vague, general terms, to which Judas listened with a smile. Jesus exhorted the apostles not to give way to their natural fears upon what he had said to them, namely, that they would all be dispersed. They should not forget their neighbor and should not allow one sentiment to veil, to stifle another, and here he made use of the similitude of a mantle. In general terms he reproached some of them for murmuring at Magdalene's anointing. Jesus probably said this in reference to Judas' first definitive step toward his betrayal, which had been taken just after that action of hers also, as a gentle warning to him for the future, since it would be after Magdalene's last anointing that he would carry out his treacherous design. That some others were scandalized at Magdalene's prodigal expression of love, arose from their erroneous severity and parsimony. They regarded this anointing as a luxury so often abused at worldly feasts while overlooking the fact that such an action performed on the Holy of Holies was worthy of the highest praise. Jesus told them, moreover, that he would only twice again teach in public. Then speaking of the end of the world and the destruction of Jerusalem, he gave them the signs by which they should know that the hour of his departure was near. There would be, he said, a strife among them as to which should be the greatest, and that would be a sign that he was about to leave them. He signified to them also that one of them would deny him, and he told them that he said all these things to them that they might be humble and watch over themselves. He spoke with extraordinary love and patience. About noon Jesus taught in the temple, his subject being the ten virgins, the talents entrusted, and he again inveighed severely against the Pharisees. He repeated the words of the murdered prophets, and several times upbraided the Pharisees for their wicked designs. He afterward told the apostles and disciples that even where there was no longer hope of improvement, words of warning must not be withheld. When Jesus left the temple, a great number of pagans from distant parts approached him. They had not, indeed, heard his teaching in the temple, since they had not dared to set foot therein. But through the sight of his miracles, his triumphal entrance on Palm Sunday, and all the other wonders that they had heard of him, they wanted to be converted. Among them were some Greeks, Jesus directed them to the disciples, a few of whom he took with him to the Mount of Olives where, in a public and formerly used by strangers only, they lodged for the night. Next morning, when the rest of the apostles and disciples came thither, Jesus instructed them upon many points. He said that he would be with them at two meals more, that he was longing to celebrate with them the last love feast in which he would bestow upon them all that humanly he could give. After that he went with them to the temple where he spoke of his return to his father, and said that he was the father's will, but this last expression I did not understand. He called himself in plain terms the salvation of mankind, said that it was he who was to put an end to the power of sin over the human race, and explained why the fallen angels were not redeemed, as well as man. The Pharisees took turns, two at a time, to spy. Jesus said that he had come to put an end to the domination of sin over man. Sin began in a garden, and in a garden it should end, for it would be in a garden that his enemies would seize him. He reproached his hearers with the fact of their already wanting to kill him after the raising of Lazarus, and said that he had kept himself at a distance, that all things might be fulfilled. He divided his journey into three parts, but I no longer recollect whether it was into thrice four, or five, or six weeks. He told them also how they would treat him and put him to death with assassins, and yet they would not be satisfied, they would not be able to effect anything against him after his death. He once more made mention of the murder just who would arise again. Yes, he even pointed out the spot in which their resurrection would take place. But as for the Pharisees, he continued, in fear and anguish they would see their designs against him frustrated. Jesus spoke likewise of Eve, through whom sin had come upon the earth. Therefore it was that woman was condemned to suffer, and that she dared not enter into the sanctuary. 
But it was also through a woman that the cure of sin had come into the world, consequently she was freed from slavery, though not from dependence. Jesus again took up quarters in the inn at the foot of Mount Olivet. A lamp was lighted, and the Sabbath exercises were performed. Next morning Jesus went with his followers across the brook Cedron, and then northward by a row of houses between which were little grass plots on which sheep were grazing. Here was situated John Mark's house. Jesus then turned off to Gethsemane, a little village as large as Bethphage, built on either side of the brook Cedron. John Mark's house stood a quarter of an hour outside the gate through which the cattle were led to the cattle market on the north side of the temple. It was built upon a high hill which, at a later period, was covered with houses. It was from here to Gethsemane one half hour, and from Gethsemane across the Mount of Olives to Bethania, something less than an hour. The last named place lay almost in a straight line east of the temple and, by the direct route, it may have been only one hour from Jerusalem. From certain points of the temple and from the castles in the rear, one could describe Bethania. Bethphage, however, was not in sight, as it lay low, and the view was, besides, up to the point at which the temple could be seen through a defile of the mountain road, obstructed by the Mount of Olives. As Jesus was he going over the brook Cedron to Gethsemane with the disciples, he said to the apostles as they were entering a hollow of the Mount of Olives, Here will ye abandon me. Here shall I be taken prisoner. He was very much troubled. He proceeded afterward to Lazarus, in Bethania, thence to the disciples in, after which he went with some of them around the environs of the city consoling the inhabitants, like one bidding farewell. That evening there was a supper at Lazarus, at which the holy women assisted in the graded apartment. At the close of the meal, Jesus told them all that they could have one night more of peaceful sleep. Early the next morning Jesus went with the disciples to Jerusalem. Having crossed the Cedron in front of the temple, he continued his course outside the city toward the south, till he came to a little gate, by which he entered, and crossing a stone bridge that spanned a deep abyss, he reached the foot of Mount Shaun. There were caverns also under the temple. Here Jesus turned from the south side of the temple and proceeded through a long vaulted corridor, which was lighted only from above, into the women's portico. Here, turning toward the east, he passed through the doorway allotted to women condemned on account of their sterility, crossed the hall in which offerings were made, and proceeded to the teacher's chair in the outer hall of the temple. This door always stood open, although at Jesus' instructions, all the other entrances to the temple were often closed by the Pharisees. They said, Let the sin door always remain open to the sinner. In words admirable and deeply significant, Jesus taught upon union and separation. He made use of the similitude of fire and water, which are opposed to each other, one of which extinguishes the other, though if the latter does not get the better of the former, the flames become wilder and more powerful. He next spoke of persecution and martyrdom. Under the figure of fire, Jesus alluded to those disciples that would remain true to him, and under that of water, to those that would separate from him and seek the abyss. He called water the martyr of fire, he spoke also of the mingling of water and milk, naming it an intimate commingling that no one could separate. Jesus wished under this figure to designate his own union with his followers, and he dwelt upon the mild and nutritive properties of milk. From this he passed to the subject of marriage and its union, as the disciples had questioned him upon the reunion after death of friends and married people. Jesus said that there was a twofold union in marriage, the union of flesh and blood, which death cuts asunder, and they that were so bound would not find themselves together after death, and the union of soul, which would outlive death. They should not, he continued, be disquieted as to whether they would be alone or together in the other world. They that had been united in union of soul in this life, would form but one body in the next. He spoke also of the bridegroom and named the church his affianced. Of the martyrdom of the body, he said that it was not to be feared, since that of the soul was the more frightful. As the apostles and disciples did not comprehend all that he said, Jesus directed them to write down what they failed to understand. Then I saw John, James the Less, and another making signs from time to time on a little tablet that they held before them resting on a support. They wrote upon little rolls of parchment with a colored liquid, which they carried with them in a kind of horn. They drew the little rolls out of their breast pockets, and wrote only in the beginning of the instruction. 
Jesus spoke likewise of his own union with them, which would be accomplished at the Last Supper, and which could by nothing be dissolved. The obligation of perfect continence, Jesus exposed to the apostles by way of interrogation. He asked, for instance, could you do such and such a thing at the same time? And he spoke of a sacrifice that had to be offered, all which led to perfect continence as a conclusion. He adduced as examples Abraham and the other patriarchs who, before offering sacrifice, always purified themselves and observed a long continence. When he spoke of baptism and the other sacraments, he said that he would send to them the Holy Ghost who, by his baptism, would make them all children of redemption. They should after his death baptize at the pool of Bethsaida all that would come and ask for it. If a great number presented themselves, they should lay their hands upon their shoulders, two and two, and baptize them there under the stream of the pump, or jet. As formerly the angel, so now would the Holy Ghost come upon the baptized as soon as his blood should have been shed, and even before they themselves had received the Holy Spirit. Peter, who had been appointed by Jesus' chief over the others, asked as such whether they were always to act in this manner without first proving and instructing the people. Jesus answered that the people would be wearied out with waiting for feast days and pining meantime in aridity. Therefore they, the apostles, should not delay to do as he had just told them. When they should have received the Holy Ghost, then they would always know what they should do. He addressed some words to Peter on the subject of penance and absolution and afterwards spoke to them all about the end of the world and of the signs that would precede it. A man enlightened by God would have visions on that subject. By these words, Jesus referred to John's revelations, and he himself made use of several similar illustrations. He spoke, for instance, of those that would be marked with the sign on their forehead, and said that the fountain of living water which flowed from Calvary's mount would at the end of the world appear to be almost entirely poisoned, though all the good waters would finally be gathered into the valley of Josaphat. It seemed to me that he said also that all water was to become once more baptismal water. No Pharisees were present at any part of this instruction. That evening Jesus returned to Lazarus, in Bethania. The whole of the next day Jesus taught undisturbed in the temple. He spoke of truth and the necessity of acting out what they, the apostles, taught. He himself, he said, was now about to fulfill it. It is not enough to believe, one must practice one's faith. No one, not even the Pharisees themselves, could reproach him with the least error in his teaching, and now by returning to his father he would fulfill the truth he had taught. But before going he would give over to them, would leave to them, all that he possessed. Money and property he had not, but he would bequeath to them his strength and power. He would establish with them a union which should be still more intimate than that which now united them to him and which should last till the end of time. He would also bind them to one another as the members of one body. Jesus spoke of so many things that he would still do with them that Peter, conceiving new hope that he would remain longer on earth, said to him that if he were to fulfill all those things, he would have to abide with them till the end of the world. Jesus then spoke of the essence and effects of the Last Supper, without, however, mentioning it by name. He said also that he was about to celebrate his last Pasch. Peter asked where he intended to do so. Jesus answered that he would tell him in good time, and after that last Pasch he would go to his father. Peter again asked whether he would take with him his mother, whom they all loved and reverenced so much. Jesus answered that she should remain with them some years longer. He mentioned the number, and in it there was a five. I think he named fifteen years and then said many things in connection with her. In his instruction upon the power and effects of his Last Supper, Jesus made some allusion to No, who had once become intoxicated with wine, to the children of Israel, who had lost their taste for the manna sent them from heaven, and to the bitterness they tasted in it. As for himself, he was going to prepare the bread of life before his return home, but it was not yet ready, was not yet baked, not yet cooked. He had, he continued, so long taught them the truth, so long communicated with them, and yet they had always doubted, indeed they doubted still. He felt that in his corporeal presence he could no longer be useful to them, therefore he would give them all that he had, he would retain only what was absolutely necessary to cover his naked body. These words of Jesus, the apostles did not understand. They were under the impression that he would die, 
or perhaps vanished from their sight. As late as the preceding day, when he was speaking of the persecution of the Jews against him, Peter said that he might again withdraw from these parts, and they would accompany him. He had gone away once before after the raising of Lazarus, he could now go again. When toward evening Jesus left the temple, he spoke of taking leave of it, saying that he would never again enter it in the body. This scene was so touching that all the apostles and disciples cast themselves on the ground crying aloud and weeping. Jesus wept also. Judas shed no tear, though he was anxious and nervous, as he had been during the past days. Yesterday Jesus said no word in allusion to him. In the court of the temple, some heathens were waiting, many of whom wanted to give themselves to Jesus. They saw the tears of the apostles. On learning their desire, Jesus told them that there was no time now, but that they should later on have recourse to his apostles and disciples, to whom he gave power similar to his own. Then taking the way by which he had entered on Palm Sunday, and frequently turning with sad and earnest words to gaze upon the temple, he left the city, went to the public and at the foot of Mount Olivet, and after nightfall back to Bethania. Here Jesus taught at Lazarus, continuing his instructions during the evening meal, at which the women, who now kept themselves less aloof, served. Jesus gave orders for a plentiful meal to be prepared at Simon's public house on the following day. It was very quiet in Jerusalem all this day. The Pharisees did not go to the temple, but assembled in council. They were very anxious on account of Judas' non-appearance. Many good people of the city were in great distress at Jesus' predictions, which they had heard from the disciples. I saw Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea, Simeon's sons, and others looking very troubled and anxious, though they had not yet withdrawn from the rest of the Jews. They were still mixing with them in the affairs of everyday life. I saw Veronica also, going about her house sad and wringing her hands. Her husband inquired the cause of her affliction. Her house was situated in Jerusalem between the temple and Mount Calvary. Seventy-six of the disciples lodged in the hall surrounding the cenacle. Next morning Jesus instructed a large number of the disciples, more than sixty, in the court before Lazarus' house. In the afternoon, about three o'clock, tables were laid for them in the court, and during their meal Jesus and the apostles served. I saw Jesus going from table to table handing something to this one, something to that, and teaching all the time, Judas was not present. He was away making purchases for the entertainment to be given at Simon's. Magdalene also had gone to Jerusalem, to buy precious ointment. The Blessed Virgin, to whom Jesus had that morning announced his approaching death, was inexpressibly sad. Her niece, Mary Cleophas, was always around her, consoling her. Full of grief, they went together to the disciples' inn. Meantime, Jesus conversed with the disciples upon his approaching death and the events that would follow it. One, he said, that had been on intimate terms with him, one that owed him a great debt of gratitude, was about to sell him to the Pharisees. He would not even set a price upon him, but would merely ask, What will ye give me for him? If the Pharisees were buying a slave, it would be at a fixed price, but he would be sold for whatever they chose to give. The trader would sell him for less than the cost of a slave. The disciples wept bitterly, and became so afflicted that they had to cease eating, but Jesus pressed them graciously. I have often noticed that the disciples were much more affectionate toward Jesus than were the apostles. I think as they were not so much with him, they were on that account more humble. This morning Jesus spoke of many things with his apostles. As they did not understand everything, he commanded them to write down what they could not comprehend, saying that when he would send his spirit to them, they would recall those points and be able to seize their meaning. I saw John and some of the others taking notes. Jesus dwelt long upon their flight, when he himself would be delivered up to the Pharisees. They could not think that such a thing would ever happen to them, and yet they really did take to flight. He predicted many things that were to follow that event, and told them how they should conduct themselves. At last he spoke of his holy mother. He said that through compassion, she would suffer with him all the cruel torture of his death, that with him, she would die his bitter death and still would have to survive him fifteen years. Jesus indicated to the disciples whither they should betake themselves, some to Arimathea, some to Sychar, and others to Kedar. The three that had accompanied him on his last journey were not to return home. 
since their ideas and sentiments had undergone so great a change, it would not be well for them to return to their country. Otherwise they might give scandal or, on account of the opposition of friends, run the risk of falling back into their former way of acting. Eliud and Aramenzio went, I think, to Sikhar, but Silas remained where he was. And thus Jesus went on instructing his followers with extraordinary love, counseling them on everything. I saw many of them dispersing toward evening. It was during this instruction that Magdalene came back from Jerusalem with the ointment she had brought. She had gone to Veronica's and stayed there while Veronica saw to the purchase of the ointment, which was of three kinds, the most precious that could be procured. Magdalene had expended upon it all the money she had left. One was a flask of the oil of Spikner. She bought the flask together with their contents. The former were of a clear, whitish, though not transparent material, almost like mother of pearl, though not mother of pearl. They were in shape like little urns, the swelling base ornamented with knobs, and they had screw tops. Magdalene carried the vessels under her mantle in a pocket, which hung on her breast suspended by a cord that passed over one shoulder and back across the back. John Mark's mother went back with her to Bithynia, and Veronica accompanied them a part of the way. As they were going through Bithynia, they met Judas who, concealing his indignation, spoke to Magdalene. Magdalene had heard from Veronica that the Pharisees had resolved to arrest Jesus and put him to death, but not yet, on account of the crowds of strangers and especially the numerous pagans that followed him. This news Magdalene imparted to the other women. The women were at Simon's helping to prepare for the entertainment, for which Judas had purchased everything necessary. He had entirely emptied the purse today, secretly thinking that he would get all back again in the evening. From a man who kept a garden in Bithynia, he bought vegetables, two lambs, fruit, fish, honey, etc. The dining hall used at Simon's today was different from that in which Jesus and his friends had dined once before, that is, on the day after the triumphal entrance into the temple. Today they dined in an open hall at the back of the house, and which looked out upon the courtyard. It had been ornamented for the occasion. In the ceiling was an opening which was covered with a transparent veil, and which looked like a little cupola. On either side of this cupola hung verdant pyramids of a brownish-green, succulent plant with small round leaves. The pyramids were green likewise at the base, and it seemed to me that they always remained green and fresh. Under this ceiling ornamentation stood the seat for Jesus. One side of the table, that toward the open colonnade through which the viands were brought across the courtyard, was left free. Simon, who served, alone had his place on that side. There too on the floor, under the table, stood three water jugs, tall and flat. The guests reclined during this repast on low cross benches, which in the back had a support, and in front an arm upon which to lean. The benches stood in pairs, and they were sufficiently wide to admit of the guests sitting two and two, facing each other. Jesus reclined at the middle of the table upon a seat to himself. On this occasion the women ate in an open hall to the left. Looking obliquely across the courtyard, they could see the men at table. When all was prepared, Simon and his servant, in festal robes, went to conduct Jesus, the apostles, and Lazarus. Simon wore a long robe, a girdle embroidered in figures, and on his arm a long fur-lined maniple. The servant wore a sleeveless jacket. Simon escorted Jesus, the servant, the apostles. They did not traverse the street to Simon's, but went in their festal robes back through the garden into the hall. There were numbers of people in Bithynia, and the crowds of strangers who had come through a desire to see Lazarus raised somewhat of a tumult. It was also a cause of surprise and dissatisfaction to the people that Simon, whose house formerly stood open, had purchased so large a supply of provisions and closed his establishment. They became in a short time angry and inquisitive, and almost scaled the walls during the meal. I do not remember having seen any foot washing going on, but only some little purification before entering the hall. Several large drinking glasses stood on the table, and beside each, two smaller ones. There were three kinds of beverages, one greenish, another red, and the third yellow. I think it was some kind of pear juice. The lamb was served first. It lay stretched out on an oval dish, the head resting on the four feet. The dish was placed with the head toward Jesus. Jesus took a white knife, 
like bone or stone, inserted it into the back of the lamb, and cut first to one side of the neck and then to the other. After that he drew the knife down, making a cut from the head along the whole back. The lines of this cut at once reminded me of the cross. He then laid the slices thus detached before John, Peter and himself, and directed Simon, the host, to carve the lamb down the sides, and lay the pieces right and left before the apostles and Lazarus as they sat in order. The holy women were seated around their own table. Magdalene, who was in tears all the time, sat opposite the Blessed Virgin. There were seven or nine present. They too had a little lamb. It was smaller than that of the other table and lay stretched out flat in the dish, the head toward the Mother of God. She it was who carved it. The lamb was followed by three large fish and several small ones. The large ones lay in the dish as if swimming in a stiff, white sauce. Then came pastry, little rolls in the shape of lambs, birds with outstretched wings, honeycombs, green herbs like lettuce, and a sauce in which the last named were steeped. I think it was oil. This course was followed by another fruit that looked like pears. In the center of the dish was something like a gourd upon which other fruit, like grapes, were stuck by their stems. The dishes used throughout the meal were partly white, the inside partly yellow, and they were deep or shallow according to their contents. Jesus taught during the whole meal. It was nearing the close of his discourse. The apostles were stretched forward in breathless attention. Simon, whose services were no longer needed, sat motionless, listening to every word, when Magdalene rose quietly from her seat among the holy women. She had around her a thin, bluish-white mantle, something like the material worn by the three holy kings, and her flowing hair was covered with a veil. Laying the ointment in a fold of her mantle, she passed through the walk that was planted with shrubbery, entered the hall, went up behind Jesus, and cast herself down at his feet, weeping bitterly. She bent her face low over the foot that was resting on the couch, while Jesus himself raised to her the other that was hanging a little toward the floor. Magdalene loosened the sandals and anointed Jesus' feet on the saws and upon the upper part. Then with both hands drawing her flowing hair from beneath her veil, she wiped the Lord's anointed feet and replaced the sandals. Magdalene's action caused some interruption in Jesus' discourse. He had observed her approach, but the others were taken by surprise. Jesus said, Be not scandalized at this woman, and then addressed some words softly to her. She now arose, stepped behind him and poured over his head some costly water, and that so plentifully that it ran down upon his garments. Then with her hand she spread some of the ointment from the crown down the hind part of his head. The hall was filled with the delicious odor. The apostles whispered together and muttered their displeasure, even Peter was vexed at the interruption. Magdalene, weeping and veiled, withdrew around behind the table. When she was about to pass before Judas, he stretched forth his hand to stay her while he indignantly addressed to her some words on her extravagance, saying that the purchase money might have been given to the poor. Magdalene made no reply. She was weeping bitterly. Then Jesus spoke, bidding them let her pass, and saying that she had anointed him for his death, for later she would not be able to do it, and that wherever this gospel would be preached, her action and their murmuring would also be recounted. Magdalene retired, her heart full of sorrow. The rest of the meal was disturbed by the displeasure of the apostles and the reproaches of Jesus. When it was over, all returned to Lazarus. Judas, full of wrath and avarice, thought within himself that he could no longer put up with such things. But concealing his feelings, he laid aside his festal garment, and pretended that he had to go back to the public house to see that what remained of the meal was given to the poor. Instead of doing that, however, he ran full speed to Jerusalem. I saw the devil with him all the time, red, thin-bodied, and angular. He was before him and behind him, as if lighting the way for him, Judas saw through the darkness. He stumbled not, but ran along in perfect safety. I saw him in Jerusalem running into the house in which, later on, Jesus was exposed to scorn and derision. The Pharisees and high priests were still together, but Judas did not enter their assembly. Two of them went out and spoke with him below in the courtyard. When he told them that he was ready to deliver Jesus and asked what they would give for him, they showed great joy and returned to announce it to the rest of the council. After a while, 
one came out again and made an offer of thirty pieces of silver. Judas wanted to receive them at once, but they would not give them to him. They said that he had once before been there, and then had absented himself for so long, that he should do his duty, and then they would pay him. I saw them offering hands as a pledge of the contract, and on both sides tearing something from their clothing. The Pharisees wanted Judas to stay a while and tell them when and how the bargain would be completed. But he insisted upon going, that suspicion might not be excited. He said that he had yet to find things out more precisely, that next day he could act without attracting attention. I saw the devil the whole time between Judas and the Pharisees. On leaving Jerusalem, Judas ran back again to Bethania, where he changed his garments and joined the other apostles. Jesus remained at Lazarus, while his followers withdrew to their own inn. That night Nicodemus came from Jerusalem, and on his return Lazarus accompanied him a part of the way. Prayer for the Intercession of Blessed and Catherine Emmerich O oh, Blessed and Catherine Emmerich, devout and pious follower of Christ, who patiently endured the frailty of this mortal condition, who humbly received the honorable marks of Christ Jesus on your hands, feet, side, head, and chest, the marks which you were blessed by the Lord to witness for yourself in his own sufferings, we graciously ask for your intercession with God, that we sinners may be forgiven of our sins and be drawn more completely into spiritual communion with Christ our Lord. We ask this in the name of the Most Holy Lamb of God and through the intercession of Holy Mary, our Mother. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now, and at the hour of death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Blessed and Catherine Emmerich, pray for us.